Hey, and Julie, you may need to fix your name. Yeah, rename you yourself. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me just. You don't look um, like Jake. <laughs> How do I even do that? Go up to the. Name, there we go. Got it. Yeah. Sorry, Jake. There you go. I didn't mean to be you. <laughs> Well, you clicked on the email I sent, that's why. It's good. You're, you're on mute, Hillary. It looks like our waiting room has emptied and everyone who okay. was waiting is now in the meeting. Okay, well, let's get going then. Okay, um, hello and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us for um, the fourth of four online community engagement meetings um, for Salt Lake County's West General Plan, which is a high level long range document to help guide the future of the Western third of the county with an emphasis on the unincorporated areas. I'm Brian Wilkinson of Wilkinson Friar and Company Communications. Um, part of the, I'm part of the project team and will be the MC this evening. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so let's go over the agenda. If uh, Hillary, if you could put that up on the screen, or Jake, or whoever is in charge of that. Um, uh, in just a moment, I'll introduce the group of folks who are here this evening to respond to questions and comments, and then we will uh, watch a short video that gives an overview of the. Um, the need for the plan, the, the uh, planning process and the progress that's been made to date. That'll be followed by a presentation by Salt Lake County planners uh, with more details about the needs and opportunities of the three geographic areas the planning process focuses on. Um, we'll talk about all three of those tonight, although the, mo the main focus of this meeting is on the Southwest Oakers and Traverse Ridge or Traverse <laughs> Mountains. Um, excuse me, which includes unincorporated um, areas as well as Harriman, Rip, uh, Riverton, Bluffdale, High Country Estates, and Camp Williams. Um, that presentation will last about 20 minutes or so. Um, after that, we will have uh, ample time for a question and answer session with our group of experts before we adjourn at um, seven. Um, let's see, is the list, uh, we put the list of um, uh, uh, panelists up, please. And I can't tell if it's up, so. Blue. Can you not see the panelists list? I, I cannot. Can everyone else? No, we can't, Hillary. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, the folks here tonight to uh, present and answer questions. Um, Helen Peters, who is Transportation Pro Program Manager for Salt Lake County. Uh, Ryan Perry is Director of Regional Planning and Transportation for the County. Jordan Carroll is Communications Manager for um, Regional uh, um, uh, Development, Regional Planning, excuse me. Um, Jake Young is the Planning Program Manager and he's also the, the uh, um, Project Lead for the West General Plan. Um, John Ruedis from Salt Lake County Parks and Recreation. Uh, Walt Gilmore is um, uh, Parks and Recreation uh, with Wasatch Front Regional Council. Julie Bjornstad, also with Wasatch Front, um, doing uh, transportation planning. Thomas McMurtry is a transportation consultant working with the, uh, the county team on, on the project. Uh, I introduced myself. And finally, Paul Raymond, um, who is with uh, Camp Williams. Um, Brian, yes. one correction. Uh, Walt, Gil uh, Walt Gilmore is uh, with Salt Lake County Parks and Rec Recreation, oh. and and he is over uh, parks planning and recreation, parks and trails planning and design. He's he's the manager director of that. Great, thank you. Sorry for the the uh, typo there. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Just one last thing uh, before. Uh, we go on to the uh, the video. Um, since this is an online meeting, you have two options to ask a question or make a comment. 
Um, you can use the Q&A function or the, um, um, what's the other one called? The raise hand function, both of which are, are buttons on the control panel uh, at the bottom of your screen, the bottom of the, the Zoom window. Um, if you uh, type on the Q&A function, you can type your question into the uh, uh, question box, uh, push enter, it will come to the, the panelists and we'll be able to see it and, and uh, be ready to respond to that question. If you'd rather make a, a comment or ask a question verbally, you can do that as well. Um, click on the, the raise hand uh, button and a little hand will go up on next to your, your name in the list and we will call on you um, during the Q&A session. And we'll go over that again when we get closer to the, the Q&A. Um, so um, I think that's it for the preliminaries. Let's- yes. and, uh, and Brian, can I just recognize Catherine Cantor, oh, who thank is you. the Deputy yes, Mayor of uh, Regional Operations, and then also Dina Blaze, who is the Director of Office of Regional Development for Salt Lake County. Thanks for joining us. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, okay, uh, we've got a lot to get through, so let's go right to the uh, overview video and uh, um, let it go. I'm Salt Lake County Mayor Jenny Wilson, and I'm standing here on the county's beautiful west side with the vast Great Salt Lake and its wetlands to the north and the towering Ochre Mountains behind me. Utah and Salt Lake County have grown quickly in recent years and will continue to for the foreseeable future. Growth can bring great opportunities to our residents and communities, but it can also bring challenges that require us to work collaboratively and proactively to plan for tomorrow and beyond. Salt Lake County is planning for the future of the large unincorporated areas along the West Bench and the Great Salt Lake shoreline, as well as planning for other opportunities and challenges that we will face as the county continues to grow. We thank you for investing your time in helping to shape the future of Salt Lake County by sharing your feedback. And we look forward to working with you to make our community a beautiful, safe, sustainable, and thriving place to live and work. Salt Lake County, Utah's most populous area, has more than 1.2 million residents today and is expected to grow to 1.8 million people or more by the year 2065. That's a third more residents, 600,000 more over the next 40 plus years. While this may sound like a long time, it will be here before we know it. Especially considering the amount of time it takes to adequately plan and prepare for sustainable growth. So where will these new residents live? Some new residents will live within existing cities located in the eastern two-thirds of Salt Lake County, while many more will likely reside in the western third. This area contains most of the remaining vacant, developable land and is where approximately 60% of the county's growth has occurred since 2000. This map shows land that can potentially be developed within existing cities and townships, as well as land in unincorporated Salt Lake County that could be developed in the long term. Planning for and managing growth is critically important, yet it's not an easy thing to do. Planning for growth is a shared responsibility that involves government agencies at the federal, state, county, and municipal levels. All municipalities and counties are required to have long-range plans for the future, called general plans. Counties are responsible for land use planning in unincorporated areas. In Salt Lake County, this includes Wasatch Canyons and large parcels of unincorporated land in the western portion of the county. Funds for many growth-related issues, such as road construction and transit, are distributed through multi-county agencies, like the Wasatch Front Regional Council, or transportation agencies like UDOT and UTA. Salt Lake County started the West General Plan process in 2018 and is expected to conclude in 2021. Planning for and managing growth is critically important and requires a series of steps, beginning with an inventory and assessment of existing conditions, such as the existence of roads, utilities, and other infrastructure and their condition, the types of nearby land uses, priorities laid out in adjacent cities' general plans, the availability of water, the county's ability to provide services to new development, 
and plans of surrounding private landowners. Once the detailed research is complete, the next step is to share that information with residents and local officials. Seek their comments and listen to suggestions through open houses, presentations, workshops, and online surveys. For example, since the West General Plan process began, the county has held over 25 engagement meetings and conducted two online surveys. The first survey, seeking feedback on growth issues with the plan, received a total of 2,534 responses and 1,268 comments. The second survey on the vision statements had 2,066 responses and 3,876 comments. To plan for growth and land conservation, the county needs to evaluate the challenges and opportunities presented by both and find the balance between them. Growth can bring new job prospects, increased sales tax revenue, greater variety in housing, and more and improved community amenities. However, growth can also bring significant challenges, making it difficult to provide housing for new residents, build roads and transit systems, extend utilities, and provide desired parks and recreation opportunities. And importantly, growth can also raise concerns from current residents about how the county can accommodate new neighbors and development without harming the existing quality of life. Conserving critical lands, habitat, and natural recreation resources also requires careful thought. It takes specific planning, financial resources, and long-term commitments by the public and governments. To illustrate how Western Salt Lake County can grow and provide significant opportunity for those who live, work, learn, and play there, a series of vision statements were drafted based on community input. The public was then asked to review these statements and provide comments via an online survey. The survey results convey what residents feel the future for Western Salt Lake County can be. 68%, more than two-thirds of survey respondents, said they agree with the plan's draft vision statement. Salt Lake County's vision is that the West areas provide enduring communities, employment centers, and open spaces. Communities are integrated with a multimodal transportation system and driven by a commitment to respect the landscape, conserve natural systems, and develop public resources. These future communities consist of a variety of districts, centers, and neighborhoods, each creating safe and beautiful places for our children, current and future generations, to live and work. Residents who took the survey also had positive reactions to more specific vision statements about land use, transportation, recreation, environment and conservation, economy, housing, and utilities and public safety. As Salt Lake County looked at its role in planning for the future of unincorporated areas, three geographic zones stood out for the West General Plan. The Great Salt Lake Shoreline, North and Central Ochre Mountains, and the Southwest Ochres and Camp Williams. Each of these areas presents unique opportunities and challenges. The Great Salt Lake Shoreline includes a mixture of large preserved wildlife habitat, bird refuges, private waterfowl management areas, and some of the last working farms in the county. It plays a key role in protecting the Great Salt Lake through water rights, natural land conservation, and the preservation of historic uses. Some significant challenges in the area include the shrinking of the Great Salt Lake, changing adjacent uses including the construction of a new state prison, and ensuring that current and future land uses remain compatible with the preservation of habitat for migratory birds and other wildlife. In the northern and central parts of the Ochre Mountains, where much of the land is privately owned by Rio Tinto Kennecott, the focus is on mining reclamation, conserving land for future parks, recreation and natural green spaces, and potential future residential communities and job centers. The southwestern corner of the county, including Camp Williams, offers significant potential for multiple high-quality recreation opportunities in Butterfield, Yellow Fork, and Rose Canyons. The area also offers the potential for partnering with the state on land conservation, fire protection, and public safety in the Camp Williams area. 
So what happens next with the West general plan? Over the next several months, the county will seek additional public feedback about the three geographic areas of focus, including soliciting suggestions about how to achieve community goals in each area. After a series of engagement activities, a draft West General Plan will be presented to the County Planning Commission and County Council for review. Both governing bodies will hold public hearings which will provide additional opportunities for the community to give their input. Once approved, county officials will start working with communities, landowners, municipalities, and other stakeholders to implement the plan. Thank you for taking the time to learn about the importance of the West General Plan and how we are investing in the future of Western Salt Lake County. This plan shows us what the Great Salt Lake Shoreline, the Ochre Mountains, and the Southern Traverse Ridge area could look like in 40 years. Some of the items in the General Plan are applicable today. Others will be better preparing us for the coming decades. The input we receive from county residents is vital to shaping our future acknowledging population growth while maintaining the high quality of life we enjoy today. I encourage you to learn more about this process and stay up to date on the latest involvement opportunities by visiting the project website. On behalf of all of us in Salt Lake County, thank you again. Gotta to remember to unmute myself. Um, great, um, uh, hope you found the video, uh, provided a good overview of why and how the West General Plan is, is being done. Um, let's dig a bit deeper now and explore the needs and opportunities of the, uh, the planning areas talked about in the video with an emphasis tonight on the Southwest Oakers and Traverse uh, Mountains area. Um, I'd like to introduce again, uh, Jake Young, um, Salt Lake County Planner and Project Manager for uh, the West General Plan Project, who will walk us through uh, this presentation, and um, Helen Peters, Salt Lake County Transportation Planner, um, will also say a few, few words about, guess what, transportation, <laughs> since that's her focus. Um, so Jake, uh, why don't you go ahead and start? Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about the West General Plan and, and thank you for attending this online community engagement meeting this evening. We know you're busy and you have a lot going on and we appreciate your time and look forward to talking with you about the project after the presentation. What is a general plan? Well, it's a long range or com comprehensive plan for counties. General plans are general in nature, not detailed. Uh, typically they look 15 to 20 years out, but this one looks even farther. 30, 40 years and beyond at the Ochre Mountains. Also, they're required by state code. Um, when, looking at, when looking at general plans, we often wonder, well, where does a general plan go from here after it's adopted? Or what are the different steps going towards implementation? This diagram shows you the general plans are general. The next level are transportation, master plans, capital improvement plans, and then zoning and site, site plans. The closer you get towards the top of the diagram, the, the more detail you see in, in that. Zoning ordinances and also site plans are more detailed. What is required in the general plan? Well, uh, according to state law, land use, housing, and transportation. Also in this general plan, we will, we will include environment conservation, recreation, economy, utilities, and public safety. These are the three areas of the plan, the shoreline area, the north and central ochres, and also the Southwest Ochres Traverse Mountains. Uh, as mentioned in the video, we began this process in 2018, doing an existing condition study, not only of the unincorporated area, but the bigger area as well, from Bangor to the top of the Ochre Mountains, looking at how Solid County has been growing for the last 20 years. You can find this at our website, ochreview.org. In 2019, we did a survey with the public to understand the big and major issues that people were concerned about. We've been out in the field meeting with landowners, land managers, talking with cities, really understanding how the health conditions are in the field and on the ground. Monthly, we have planning commission discussion and review, uh, continual steering committee review and discussion, also ongoing meeting with stakeholders and elected officials, and also 
public meetings and surveys like this one. All general plans have good vision with them. And as you saw in the video, we have, a, we have a vision for the overall plan, but we also have vision just for the specific areas. As part of the seven different categories or seven elements of the plan, there are vision statements for that. Land use, transportation, housing, environment, conservation, recreation, economy, utilities, and public safety. All of them have vision statements for the plan. We shared these draft vision statements with the public last year and received more than 2,000 responses to that survey. If you have not seen our, our vision uh, survey, I would encourage you to check it out at the project website. The plan began in 2018 and is expected to conclude this year in 2021. This, as, as Brian mentioned, this is the fourth of, of the four public online community meetings as part of the, the planning process. Thank you again for coming. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the shoreline area. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the North and Central Ochres, and then we'll spend a little more time also talking about the Southwest Ochres and Camp Williams. And we do have our partners here with, with Salt Lake County Parks and Rec to talk about Yellow Fork and Rose Canyon and Butterfield. And also Camp Williams is here to join us as well to answer questions. So when looking at the shoreline, which is the south area of the Great Salt Lake or the north area of Salt Lake County, there are three major landowners or land groups, you could say, land management of the shoreline area. We have the waterfowl areas you see in yellow on your screen, agriculture lands in green, and then in blue you see the Audubon property, which is also linked to the Rio Tinto ISSR property, which is the Inland Sea Shorebird Reserve. And these are the four major areas of the shoreline area, along with the Great Salt Lake land owned by the state of Utah. Some of the issues facing this area include the shrinking lake, the hotter and drier climate, also threats from corridor expansion, road expansion threats, changes, um, potential changes to adjacent land uses or development, and also impacts from, from adjacent land uses as well. What are the opportunities for the shoreline area? Well, it includes the opportunity to create more buffers between the habitat areas and adjacent uses. The opportunity to further conserve the land as it is being used today. Also a potential public um, bird habitat outreach educational center by Rio Tinto and potential partnerships to, to achieve common goals. Some of the recommendations for this area include promoting the awareness of, of the Great Salt Lake shoreline area and its role in the Great Salt Lake watershed. Potential recommendations on future land use and zoning changes revolving ar around conservation, more efforts on co water conservation. And I wanna stop for a second on water conservation and, and mention that this recommendation applies to the whole plan, not just water conservation for shoreline area only, but also water conservation for the Ochre Mountains and also the Traverse Mountains area and also potential future development also with water conservation. Also recommendations include uh, future transportation and utilities are compatible with, with conservation goals and looking at conservation tools and collaborating on invasive weeds. When looking at the future land use map, this area is primarily categorized under, we, we say SC, you see on the map there, that stands for shoreline conservation. And that's conservation of current uses, agriculture, but also conservation of habitat areas as well. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about the North and Central Ochres. Nice view looking at the Ochres on the ridge line from the South. When looking at the, at the Ochres, it's important to understand the land ownership of this area. Uh, you'll see land ownership map before you on the screen. The Rio Tinto properties are in tan and also the, the sand color there. Much of the land is owned by Rio Tinto, but there are other private properties as well. And you'll see the last holdout property in the south and pink. And then in green, you'll see some other private properties as well. It's important to understand the geography and the difference between the Wasatch and the Ochre Mountains. The Ochres are a little more gradual, more hills at the base, and then go steeper at the top. 
And you'll see this, this 3D map at the bottom, the ochres, but also if you look on the left, left side, you'll see the Traverse Mountains and how they follow some of that terrain of the rolling hills and going up to the ridge as well. Uh, the habitat area in terms of mammals has elk and also mule deer. And the mule deer, mule deer come down on the foothills and move into the Camp Williams property as well. Uh, now, when looking at issues and concerns, these top ones are also the same for the Southwest area in Traverse Mountain. So I'm gonna cover those in, in the next segment, the areas that are grayed out. But some of this, the issues and concerns for the ogres include wildfire risks, housing affordability, and air quality. The opportunities for the ogres include time to plan. We have time to plan for transportation solutions, transit, and opportunities. Mining related opportunities include reclamation, conservation of natural lands and habitats, development of new recreational trails and parks, potential for clean energy production, potential for master plan communities with centers, jobs, housing, and recreational open spaces. The minus area near, near the south could be developed in the near mid to term, and that's approximately 3,500 acres. There's also opportunity for master plan communities to coordinate along the West, West Bench area. And there are master plan communities, not only in South Jordan, but also West Jordan, other cities and the unincorporated county. And there's opportunity to coordinate among them. There's opportunity for a West Bonneville shoreline trail as well on the Ochres. The recommendations for the Ochres include establish a regional land conservation plan and process. The county to collaborate with other jurisdictions in negotiating with Rio Tinto for land conservation and access to the Ochre Mountains. And this is looking forward into the future. Also the mining reclamation process to continue. And, and all of the state agencies that are involved that, with that will continue as well as the county health department and the EPA. Uh, additional recommendations include future land uses as conservation, recreation, master plan communities, industrial and commercial. We also recommend updating the master plan community process requiring detailed planning of utilities, transportation, housing, land conservation, development agreements, job zoning standards, complete communities, all of this before property can move forward in, into the M MPC. We also recommend for the county and others to work with Rio Tinto to solidify agreements and alignments for future West Bonneville shoreline trail and other associated trails. Before you is a, a draft future land use map. Uh, I want you to, to pay special attention to the red diagonal line. And then if you'll look at the, the legend on the left of your screen, you'll see it says limited development until post mine closure. And what that means is we don't see any significant land use changes uh, until the mine changes or there's significant change changes in the mining practices as they are today. The areas in brown are reclaimed historic mine areas. Areas in I are industrial or commercial areas. Uh, the areas in pink are master plan community areas. And, and again, a master plan community is not just residential, but a holistic community having a number of uses inside it. Conservation areas in green and reclamation areas, excuse me, recreation areas in yellow. There's an important relationship between land use and transportation. And Helen from our department is gonna talk a little bit about how land use and transportation work together and, and also talk a little bit about transportation planning on a regional scale and how it works with the West General Plan. Thank you, Jake. Um, land use and transportation are definitely two items that are linked together in very important ways for planning. So as transportation improvements occur and land development occurs, 
Um, the idea is to work with the land uses and create a transportation system that improves mobility. And then as land use changes, then going back and looking at that connection with um, land use. So it's kind of a very symbiotic type of relationship where land use and transportation need to work together in order for people to access where they're going and then mobility so they can get where they're going in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Um, there are two people who are, or two entities that are responsible for planning uh, transportation infrastructure in this area. One is through the Great Salt Lake Municipal Services District, and they are responsible for receiving applications from developers once the land becomes available. And as part of that um, application for a um, development agreement, they need to identify the transportation and traffic circulation in their development that, um, that uh, connects in with the regional system. And the regional system is planned by the Wasatch Front Regional Council, which is a um, metropolitan planning organization for transportation. And they're responsible for the regional transportation plan. And Julie Bornstead from Wasatch Front Regional Council is going to talk about what the regional transportation plan is. Yeah, so the regional transportation plan um, is like, like it says in the title, a regional plan. Um, it goes out at least 20, in our case, 30 years, um, looking at road, transit, and bicycling projects of regional significance. Any um, regionally significant road and transit project within the region that um, doesn't matter who the owner is or what the funding sources is, needs to be in our regional transportation plan. And so this plan is unique because it looks beyond the borders of individual cities and individual counties. Um, so the Wasatch Front Regional Transportation Plan looks from um, Brigham City down to Bluffdale and plans uh, these infrastructures as well as uh, shows the plan land uses. We're required to update this regional transportation plan every four years. Um, the projects within the plan need to be able to be paid for by reasonably assumed uh, revenue sources now and into the future. And you can see on this map, there's um, three phases. So we take those reasonably assumed revenues and we uh, divide the projects between what we can afford uh, between now and 2030, what we can afford between 2031 and 2040, and what we can afford between 2041 and 2050. And then projects that we know are needed, but we, can't, uh, we don't see revenue for them, we put those in what's called an unfunded phase. Um, and so that's, that's a general sense of the regional transportation plan. Um, Helen or Jake, is there anything else you want me to add about that? No, I think that's good. What we have on the screen right now is we have the roadway um, plan. So you can see that there is one roadway project. Here is the Oak View Boulevard that's at the very west end, or I should say at the very west um, or the easternmost edge there of the western where the mouse um, is going now. That is one project that is planned for between 2040 and 2050. And this is um, for just roadway. And um, as you know, for the last 10 years, well, in 2008, um, the leg state legislature asked um, UDOT to look at the east-west roadways connections as well as transit. And so they have made a lot of investments, UTA and UDOT over the last 10 years. And now there is some new projects on the road. Um, okay, do you wanna flip to the next one? Here's the transit plan. Um, we're looking at probably some transit along the Oakerview Boulevard. Um, and as you can see that there is transit uh, within the valley, the dark green is the near term, transit is a lighter green in the far term in the 2050 to 20 or 2041 to 2050. So looking at transit and roads and then the next slide is active transportation or bicycling, which okay. 
So there is also uh, bicycling that uh, there's a plan within the, um, there it is, the active transportation plan. And you can see that it's anticipated that probably there'll be some sort of active transportation plan along that Mountain View corridor. But you can see that there isn't many roadways planned in this area. This is all the area where there needs to be mining reclamation first prior to uh, development occurring master plan communities or anything. Okay, so let's go to the um, Southwest Salt Lake County slide. Um, in the Southwest Salt Lake County, the uh, cities of Bluffdale, Harriman, Riverton, South Jordan, West Jordan, um, and the counties unincorporated areas looked at how could they increase mobility within this area, especially looking at east-west connections. Um, and what happened is uh, the, uh, there was a uh, technical and leadership group in this area and they looked at east-west, north-south um, and looked at mobility. We took all the uh, city master plans and uh, wove those in and we came up with a preferred scenario of uh, roadways, transit, and active transportation that would increase mobility for the residents in this area to access places where they would like to go. Most of the people in this area, um, UDOT has determined, uh, leave the area, and so they're mainly wanting to go to the north and east, um, and so looking at those um, important connections. And sometimes, um, uh, East-West mobility is solved also by um, having North-South facilities like Bangor, with all the interchanges changed out into inter or all the intersections changed out to intersections and Mountain View corridor. So there are a lot of important things that are North-South that will relieve the East-West. Um, this is the preferred scenario. Um, it the RTP to um, put in to construct all the projects in the regional transportation plan is 3 billion for the RTP plus, meaning the regional transportation plan plus all the city projects um, is about 4 billion, but this preferred scenario takes about $5 billion to construct. Um, it increases people's travel time or decreases travel time, excuse me, but increases mobility and also decreases the number of hours that each household is um, spending in the car getting to places. And it also improves access to opportunity for jobs uh, via transit and auto. So it's a successful uh, set of projects that once completed will um, help with mobility and access. This now, this set of projects will now go through the regional transportation uh, analysis. And down at the bottom here, you can also learn more about this study. You can see that wfrc.org slash studies. Um, that will give you more information on that. Um, for active transportation, today only 22% of the study area is within a half mile of an active transportation backbone facility, but at the end of the day, 78% will be within a half mile of the active transportation. So it'll give people multimodal options to uh, reach their desired destination. Okay. Uh, regional connectivity is important. And Julie, do you want to speak to this for just a moment, why regional connectivity is so important and why we plan for regional facilities? Yeah, so one of the um, issues that you'll see a lot, let me, sorry, let me get my camera back on, um, and especially the southwest part of the county versus, say, like the Salt Lake City area, is that limited connectivity. And so what that does is it forces a lot of the regional trips and even local trips onto those major arterials. So the 90th South, the 126th, the 134th South, um, because there's not a lot of connection between those. And so you end up seeing a lot of congestion on both these East-West, sorry, I have a one-year-old in the back who's upset that no one's playing with them. Um, you have a lot of uh, congestion on these East-West and North-South um, arterials and freeways. And so if we can um, do better connectivity in our local neighborhoods, um, it will, some of that local traffic can get off of those regional facilities, decreasing traffic um, on those regional facilities. And also uh, there's actually fewer crashes when um, there's less congestion. So our safety increases, our traffic decreases, our travel time can decrease and we have better access to transit um, as well as better access for active transportation. Um, so those are in a nutshell, some of the benefits for uh, regional connectivity. 
Right. Great. Thanks, Julie. And then local connectivity, as Julie was saying, is very important. So we want to have things at a scale where people can bike. Um, and most people are willing to bike about a mile, walk about a fourth of a mile to get services or to reach a desired destination. So we want to have much more of a uh, much more of a local street network in this area. In the past, I think the regional network has been used as a local street uh, connectivity, and that has caused uh, congestion and people not being able to get where they're going in a reasonable amount of time. So that's something that we'll be looking at. This red hatching or red dash line and the green dash line do not represent any sort of plan or I am um, anything that's anything more than just illustrative purposes to show you that it's important to bring things down to a much smaller scale rather than the half mile or fourth of a mile, but rather bring it down to more of a community scale so you can walk to the end of the block and get and pick up a, a bus to to go into a work center. Okay. That's it. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Julie. Uh, we now like to turn our attention to the southwest part of the county. Uh, here's a nice photo of Yellow Fork and Rose Canyon area. This map shows you land ownership, land management areas. Uh, the areas in green are private properties. Uh, most of that is the High Country States area. The area in kind of a rose color is BLM. Uh, the Salt Lake County area with Yellow Fork and Rose Canyon in orange, Butterfield Canyon in yellow, and then Camp Williams in blue. Th this map shows you some of the trails planning that Parks and Rec is currently doing for the Yellow Fork, Rose Canyon, BLM, and Rio Tinto area. And we do have uh, John and Walt with us from Parks and Rec and they can answer questions about this later but I just wanted to put this map up just to let you know there's a lot of trails planning happening in this area. Uh, Camp Williams uh, began in 1914. It's approximately 52 square miles. Uh, they provide training to Utah National Guard but also our local police, milita military and other forces. Uh, a very valuable resource to Salt Lake County. Uh, this map shows you some of the areas that Camp Williams is currently pursuing to create the buffer area. Uh, the areas in green and red and kind of the salmon color, those are the, the, the buffer areas. And when we finish this, this presentation uh, for Q&A, we'll, we'll let Paul from Camp Williams talk a little bit about that as well. What are the issues facing this area? East-West traffic, need for additional transportation systems, need for more local jobs, water availability, utility infrastructure for fast growing areas, potential loss of habitat and forested areas in the ochres, drought and wildfire risks. And these concerns apply to all of the ochres, not just the Southwest. Uh, growing recreational demands in Butterfield Canyon, uh, the road is narrow, there's debris on it on occasions, graffiti, lack of cellular service, lack of amenities, the need for additional maintenance, and multiple ant landowners to work with. Uh, Camp Williams is dealing with incompatible adjacent development, trespassing, wildfire risks, and poaching. What are the opportunities for this area? Well, Butterfield Canyon, Yellow Fork, Rose Canyon, the BLM, all of this land together could be a major recreation destination, kind of like Mill Creek Canyon or Corner Canyon and Draper, a place where people drive to and, and use the trails in that area. Opportunity for trails of all types or all uses, opportunity for landowners to work together to create greater recreation opportunities for the public, kind of a real destination recreation opportunity. Opportunity to collaborate with Camp Williams to acquire the half mile to one mile buffer around the military base. Uh, this buffer could be used for habitat and recreation and also to help reduce wildfire risk. The recommendations for this area include recreation, conservation, rural, residential, and military. Uh, it's also recommended that Salt Lake County plan for Butterfield 
Canyon, Yellow Fork and Rose Canyon. And, and this is currently happening uh, as we speak uh, during this time period. Uh, but also there's opportunity to plan the Butterfield Canyon Road and Recreation Corridor, including financial plans of how to pay for it. Opportunity for landowner collaboration with all the entities mentioned, uh, along with Harriman City as well. Additional recommendations include acknowledgement and support of continued operations for Camp Williams, uh, the support of Camp Williams with the buffer lands, also work with Camp Williams to connect future preservation areas with the county's Yellow Fork and Rose Canyon trail system. And then a high country states to continue as rural residential. Let's look at this on the map. The area in purple there, RR, uh, mapped as uh, future land use as rural residential, recreation in yellow, uh, conservation areas in green, and then military uses in gray as they are today. Well, thank you for your time uh, on this presentation. We're now going to proceed into our questions and discussion. Great, uh, thanks Jake. Um, and Helen and uh, Julie uh, for, for uh, information. And I also wanted to thank them for answering some of the questions that people are asking already in the, the chat function, uh, providing resources and uh, websites and, and so forth. So thank you for that. Um, that was a lot of information in a pretty short uh, amount of time, but we've got a good 45 minutes now for um, questions and answers. Um, uh, Hillary, could you please put up the the list of or the yeah the list of people the experts uh, people who are here to answer questions just as a reminder uh, of who is here. Um, planners, uh, transportation land use planners, transportation planners, um, communications uh, people, parks and recreation planners, um, and uh, uh, folks from from Camp Williams are here uh, tonight. So. Uh, Lots of experts that can cover um, uh, cover your questions. Um, as a reminder, um, uh, you can ask your questions via the uh, Q&A function. I see a couple of folks have already started doing that. That's great. Um, just click on the Q&A button, um, type your question, press enter. It'll show up on the list and we will, we will respond. Um, if you'd like to uh, um, uh, speak your uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Ask your question verbally. Uh, just click on the raise hand uh, button on the bottom and we will call on you as well. Um, any problems navigating the system, um, you can reach out through the, the chat function um, on, the, the, uh, on the control panel and uh, uh, Hillary or another uh, staff person can help you. Um, let's see. So let's just get right into our first question. Um, and where is it there? Oh, wow. Um, a very long question <laughs> from uh, Elizabeth Waite. Um, I may uh, uh, summarize this. Um, uh, and uh, if there are other questions that are, are, are similar, I may uh, combine them as well. So um, here we go. Um, Elizabeth Waite uh, is asking a question. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see, a uh, hearing increasing concern and questions about mosquito abatement in the Northwest area along the lakeshore. Um, I understand it's been recognized that decades of chemical spraying to control mosquitoes uh, may have contributed to the uh, extraordinary high rate of autism in Utah to increase traditional spraying to manage mosquitoes near the prison location and other development sites. Um, mosquitoes and other insects uh, managed by, sprayed, by sprayed chemicals are a significant part of the food chain in the lakeshore areas. What collaboration with researchers is planned? What regular opportunities for public updates and uh, Q&A events can be expected? And what degree of planning adjustments could be expected if science indicates the need for more research and data? So a lot there to unpack. Um, Jake, would you wanna start this off and others can chime in if they'd like? 
Yes. Uh, so at, at the shoreline meeting, we received a, a similar question uh, on this topic. And, uh, and as part of this process, we have, we, like I mentioned, we've been working with stakeholders. We've been working closely with uh, the Duck Club areas, the Utah Waterfowl Association. They're very concerned uh, uh, about chemicals in the area. We're also working with the Audubon Society, ISSR, really the partners in that area, the scientists that understand the ecology and, and working with them, we're gonna develop and look at some, again, some general plan level recommendations for that area. It, it may not necessarily go into the detailed science of that in terms of, of, of really diving in deep, but it'll set the direction of that. And I, I completely recognize that as a, a big concern. We have heard that from a number of members of the public and also our stakeholders involved. So it, it's certainly something that we're looking into and, and be happy to do follow-up discussion with you as well. If you don't wanna send us a, an email, we can further dive into this and discuss it over email. Ryan, anything to add? I'm just assuming that this is a representative Elizabeth Waite and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we, we will have lots of opportunity for public engagement uh, from, from now until when we, we hope that the plan is adopted later this fall. And so as, as, as you see that plan, we hope that you would engage with us. Uh, we, we will have engagement opportunities as well and uh, hopefully further the conversation. At the general plan level, it is a, a vision and goals established for this as uh, those more detailed plans come in online, uh, we will have further engagement opportunities for those as well. Great. Thanks, uh, Jake and Ryan. And um, uh, you can always make a comment 24-7 uh, if you want. Go on onto the, uh, the website and clicking on the um, make a comment uh, 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 link. And the website is going to be on your screen right now. There it is. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, Kylie Newbold, this is a question that was asked and answered in the chat, but I'm going to read it uh, out so that uh, others can can hear. Uh, Kylie no Newbold asks, does this regional transportation plan include considerations for public transit? Um, Julie from Wasatch uh, Front Regional Council responds, yes, the regional transportation plan includes roads, transit, and active transportation, which is uh, bike lanes, uh, um, trails. Um, and also she provides a, a link for the, uh, the plan itself in the chat. So if you'd like to, to access that, uh, please do so. Um, a couple of other links to other studies as well. Um, let's see here. Um, Bob Paxton asks, is the point of the mountain uh, plan included in the West General Plan, including population growth that is in the uh, uh, projection of 600,000 new residents? Also, the public was promised um, profitability, profitability from this area to offset cost of the new prison. Is that promise still intact? Um, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I know that- uh, Brian, I can try to take a first crack at it. Okay. Uh, so, so first of all, that, that is uh, not within this West General Plan. Um, we, this West General Plan is only for the unincorporated areas of Salt Lake County. And uh, that, that uh, the site is outside of this, this plan. Uh, I, I do believe, and I can have Julie and Helen talk a little bit more, but in, in terms of projections for transit and other factors that was uh, considered in, in terms of our transportation recommendations. Uh, also in, in terms of uh, the promises that, that were uh, committed, um, those are, are state projects. And so I don't feel like I can really respond to those, but I, I certainly respect uh, where that question is coming from. Great. Great, thank you. Um, here's Brittany Ward. Um, are there plans to build a road between Harriman and Tooele? That would be awesome. Uh, sounds like a Helen Peters question. 
Yeah, there was a study completed in uh, 2017 called the Ochre Connection that provided a conceptual uh, preferred alternative and then looked at the cost estimate. And the it included a tunnel of about 5,000 feet and also um, doing some uh, roadway improvements. In fact, putting asphalt down in some areas that don't even have pavement. Um, but the project cost came in at about $329 million. And at that point, it was decided that the project was too cost prohibitive and it did not go forward. Um, the tunnel alone was estimated to um, cost $132 million. So you can see that it was a project that really needed a lot of funding. Okay. And um, I noticed the Tula County Council at that time said that they were not interested in pursuing because of the cost. And if you'd like to find out more about that, um, there is a link to that study as well in the, the chat. Uh, um, it's a, uh, on the WFRC website. Um, one other website <laughs> related thing. Uh, Scott Dillenbeck asks, will this and the other online meetings be uh, available to view on the project website? And I will say yes, but I will ask Jordan uh, Carroll to uh, respond to that. If you're there. <laughs> yes, I am. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, in response to it being posted, um, they will uh, be available. Yes, the other uh, meetings available online on the website. Yes, they will be. Um, so at, at the beginning and at the end, we'll flash it and I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, slco.org backslash west hyphen plan is a great website for everyone to visit if you want more in-depth information where we'll be including recordings, the video you also watched today, and any other updates and kind of um, lists of upcoming and new meetings throughout the year. Um, it's really a great resource as well as other plans and relevant documents um, related to the West General Plan draft. They're all hyperlinked there. Um, and I'll put that in, in the chat. Great, thank you. And those should be up um, later this week, I believe. Um, great. Okay, um, let's see. Kimberly Briggs um, asks, uh, is there a bike lane plan for Rose Canyon Road leading up to Yellow Fork? Um, is there a plan for Rose Canyon Road to be widened? And if so, how many lanes? Um, Helen, does let, time go? Brian, let's have oh. uh, Walt or John from Parks and Rec talk oh, a little sure. bit oh, about the, of course. the recreation okay. of Butterfield Canyon. Wonderful. So is that Walt or John? Do you want to talk, talk about the road or do you want me to a little bit? All right. Who's the best person to answer the question about the bike lane, I guess, is what we're asking. So at this point, I'm not aware that Salt Lake County is planning a bike lane um, up Rose Canyon Road. Um, it's something that we would consider. Um, we would have to obviously do a study to see uh, if the width would accommodate that. Um, and we would probably work closely with Helen and her team to look at that as well. But um, to my knowledge, uh, there are no plans at this point to put a bike lane on Rose Canyon Road. Um, anything more to add, Helen, about the, the width of the road or? Um, you know, I know that there was going to be a small area study done looking at the trails and it's certainly important to make sure that if people are going to be looking at uh, using active transportation, right, you know, um, riding their bike to get to other trend or other activities, then we need to make sure that we can accommodate that. So I was just looking to see if anything was on the Wasatch Front Plan and also um, yeah, I'd, I'd be working with um, Public Works on the Rose Canyon. So if you yeah. would like to reach back out to me, I can check with our Public Works individuals and see what the plan is. Julie, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just gonna say the only thing we have um, in the plan in that area is a is sort of a, um, a widening slash new construction extending 7300 west down to connect to Rose Canyon, but nothing on Rose Canyon or in the actual canyon itself. Yeah. 
So that could be Public Works actually has a plan. So if you um, reach back out to me, we can discuss that. Okay. Great. A um, couple of related questions about east-west um, roads um, from a couple of folks. So I'm going to combine these. And um, um, if I don't cover everything, please uh, type in uh, type it in the Q and A again. Um, I would appreciate that. Um, this is Shanda Slater says, how are east-west roads going to be expanded to have more lanes if the plan is to make different areas in Harriman um, destinations, destination areas? The traffic is already te terrible traveling west. Um, she's also concerned with traffic and the plans for unincorporated areas that are going to be developed. Um, relatedly, um, what about a, a, a west-east highway, not just three-lane roads, um, perhaps turning 126 uh, uh, into a major highway? Um, and then finally, related to that, is the time frame to do that for an improvement of 126 south. So east-west roads. Helen, would you like to start? OK. Um, there. Yes, what happens with a road when they look at expansion is it's called capacity. And so what you will do is you'll be seeing, I know that on 114th, they're doing a study right now. Um, I know other roads over the last decade have been expanded and, and probably will need to go through another expansion again. So, um, so it looks like the question is, how are they going to be expanded? to have more lanes if the plan is to make different areas in harem and destination areas. So what we'll have to look at is um, the traffic circulation patterns. We'll have to determine which roads are best to have capacity improvements to them. And there's also other ways to make traffic flow smoothly. And that sometimes with signal timing or um, with uh, different types of turn movements to eliminate that left turn in an intersection. Um, I appreciate that there is a lot of traffic and, um, and we just, it's just going to have to go through a lot of review with engineers, with UDOT, with um, the cities and make sure that they all work together so that we don't create the congestion. And then um, the other question was from Trace on 126 South. Um, I know that was one of the pieces that was a um, piece of the preferred scenario that on 126 South that there be a connection between Mountain View Corridor and, um, and uh, Bangadar Highway. Mm -hmm. And I'm also just gonna pull up the Wasatch Front Regional Council to see exactly I'm just, am I remembering right that, that there was some money given to um, given to make improvements on 126 South at this last um, in, intersection? And since I know Trace, I will give, I will research the question and give them a call back. Trace is the engineer for um, Riverton. Okay. Um, let's no, no, wait, I was gonna say, just to add on that East West, Travel. I mean, there are specific plans for improvements on 114th and, and some things that have already been put into place, but there's others um, and 126 as well. I know they have multiple projects in multiple phases of the long range plan. And that piece that you talked about from the Southwest um, Regional Study, um, there was a plan, I think, already to look to improve um, that piece of 126 to do at least seven lanes um, in the LRTP that you know Julie's talked about so often. But I think that that new study looked for more of a system to system, um, you know, connection. And um, and I'm not sure that that you know that that it, to answer trace questions that they have a exact time lane uh, or time frame or a funding piece. And um, uh, that th that earlier question that the, um, the the lady asked, and I I. I can't remember her name, but she, I think she was talking about, are there options for improving centers on the west side? So maybe people don't have to travel to jobs so far away. And I do think that that is something that, that Jake has talked about that, it, that you know, we are looking at you know, in the West Journal plan that you know, whatever does kind of come and develop out here that we want to have a sustainable transportation system that includes maybe the possible ability of shorter trips to potential destinations. 
Great. Right. Thank the you. idea is that you want to be able to re or be able to travel to all the services and um, stores and things you need within the area in which you live. And that helps you stay off the regional roads where the congestion um, is occurring at this time. But those are future plans for Harriman. Okay. Um, we're going to stay on this. Um, transportation, who would have thought it would be a big issue? But um, um, here is the question from uh, Trevor Lithgow. What is the reason or reasons for lack of future plans for a serious east-west freeway? Surface roads don't seem to be cutting it, and we are only growing faster with each passing moment. Uh, why no freeway, uh, limited access highway? Um, Helen? <laughs> right. Well, in the 2008 study that UDOT had uh, completed, they actually identified 90th South as an east-west freeway. So I think that there is a lot of there. I know I've been in several meetings where there's been a lot of discussion about 90th South and turning that into an east-west freeway. Um, I think there's a lot of hope that by um, improving the mobility on Bangor Highway, turning the inner uh, sections into interchanges, Mountain View Quarter connecting further up north um, to I-80 that um, that will help alleviate some of the east-west connect uh, east-west issues. But yes, there's definitely a conversation on the table about what do we do with making sure that there is a limited access, um, some sort of high speed that focuses on mobility um, in the center part of the valley. It just hasn't bubbled up yet, quite yet, exactly what all the details are. Julie, do you have any comments on that? Um, no, I think you summarized it pretty well. I will just add that at this point, you know, there's a lot of um, development that has already occurred in the area and uh, trying to find that corridor that has the you know, least amount of impacts is pretty difficult. Um, any any east-west freeway sort of south of 215 is going to have um, serious impacts to houses and businesses that are already built along each one of the corridors, 90th, 126th, 134th, 114th. Um, and so I know that that's a big issue, but that Southwest Salt Lake County transportation study that's on the screen right now um, did take another look at, at that east-west freeway location. And I think we should encourage Trevor and others uh, concerned about this issue to really dive into the study. Uh, uh, more than a year's worth of effort was focused specifically on that east-west question. So uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and a lot of professional time has gone into that exact question. And, and this is the latest on it. Could, so, um, on a, yeah, I was gonna say on 126, when that intercha interchange to um, interchange, um, when that comes in, that will be a huge game changer for east-west. That's what I was just going to ask you about. Could you explain yeah. how that works a little bit more and the benefits of why uh, why it will help, uh, could help yeah. in all, all directions? Yeah. Well, what we know is that people in this area are wanting to go to the northeast area of the, of the county. And so this will give people suddenly a very north-south direct high-speed route um, with Mountain View Corridor and with Bangor Highway up into I or to I-80 and, and to then you can go east to where you need to go in that area. But this will um, take a lot of pressure off everybody trying to get to an east-west corridor to get to Redwood Road or I-15. So Julie, do you wanna to add to that? Um, yeah, just that I think the studies that you have done have shown um, Mountain View, um, and Bangor, especially when the interchanges all get converted on Bangor, really help the east-west flow, as Helen was saying, people want to move uh, northeast. And so if we can get them, instead of going north on I-15 or on Redwood, or, um, and we can push that over to Mountain View and to Bangor, um, we'll, also, we'll alleviate some of that east-west traffic as well. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Here's a question for our Parks and Rec folks, and I think um, Camp Williams uh, may want to jump in on this one as well. Um, uh, Liz, Oates, Liz Oates, excuse me, um, asks, uh, looking at the overall plan, I'm seeing a lot of proposed planned communities, 
Um, why are we trying to develop so much of the Ochre Mountains where wildlife and open spaces currently exist? I worry if we open, overdevelop these beautiful areas, we will be losing state treasures. Shouldn't we uh, look at preserving more areas and carefully using it for recreation and preservation? Um, let's see, Jake, do you wanna start this and then we'll go to the parks folks and the Camp Williams folks? Uh. Sure, uh, it, it's a great question, uh, big concern. We've heard that from a lot of people regarding that. Uh, the plan does have a major conservation element, a lot of areas identified, also the, the goal of a conservation plan and process. Hopefully through that process, maybe even more areas are identified for conservation. Uh, this, this plan does recognize that the majority of the land is privately owned on, on the Ochres, central and, and north part of the Ochres. It's privately owned and currently there are there is opportunity that Rio Tinto could even be developing today if they wanted. They do have development rights that they could pursue currently. Um, th this plan is proposing as, as many conservation techniques and opportunities as possible. Those will be flushed out in the future, looked at. Uh, it'll require all the cities on the west side to collaborate, county to look at it, county to work with the state. I mean, it, it's gonna take a lot of people and a lot of dollars to make as much conservation as possible happen. And, and we are looking at, at as many conservation tools as we can. But we also recognize there is private property and, and a growing population as well. So Jake, I might be reading into the question a little bit too much too, but um, so, so the, the west side of the valley has kind of a, a, a gentler slope to it than, than the, the east side mountains do. And so when you look at the planned PC areas for this general plan, um, it's not all encompassing our mountainous areas. And so I, I think that's something that we wanna be very sensitive to because uh, we really have tried to uh, look at recreation and conservation in all of our mountainous areas. Uh, a PC zone is, is kind of important for us for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, it, it really uh, has a public process attached to it. And so there's lots of public input on the proposal and public hearings that's attached to it and, and decision-making that, that is very visible. And you get kind of a holistic perspective of what the plan is. You, you don't get 50 homes here or, or 20 homes there and, and a system that doesn't connect to it. And so that was part of why that, that seemed to really fit. Um, it, it helps better plan for where centers are going to be, how transportation is gonna fit into it. And it also helps us, um, th these areas have a high potential of annexation surrounding communities. And so it helps us bring in those communities to say, what is the future of this area? And how does it fit within your community? And how can we have that flow together? So I, I hope that uh, uh, that helps as well. I, I want to add one, one thing to that, Ryan, as well. Um, uh, there's opportunity also for conservation within the plan community area. Uh, recently, I was looking at plans by a proposed plan community within a city, not, not the unincorporated county, but within a city within Salt Lake County. And this plan community had 40% open space within that planned community. So the, the pink areas or the master plan community areas are, are also not all developed as well. Certainly it's possible there could be a range of 20 to 40% open space within those areas as well. Um, if, if Parks and Rec folks or Camp Williams have any thoughts they'd like to share on conservation and open space, we'd love to hear your input as well. Yeah, maybe. Oh, what, what go, you, how about John? Let's go with uh, uh, John Redis, please. Okay, um, I I think Jake hit on a lot of the issues that I was going to bring up. The fact that um, so much privately owned land is is found along the the ochres. Obviously, uh, our goal in Parks and Rec is we love to and we strive to develop areas and open spaces and parks and. Um, land that is accessible for recreational use. And um, I think that is why it's key as, as, as we look at um, planning and development of these recreation areas that we, we find 
opportunities to do that. Um, but what we are trying to do is uh, capitalize on the land that the county does currently own, which is the areas of Rose Canyon and uh, Yellow Fork. And so we're, as, as we're um, looking to uh, update our master plan, we're trying to address some of the, the, the concerns and also the, uh, the, the demand of recreation, especially in the Southwest quadrant where we see so much growth. And so um, we're doing what we can with the lands we own at, this, at, at the moment, but we're also looking into the future and looking for opportunities to potentially acquire land um, as funds become available. Um, that's another goal of ours is to um, acquire land that we can preserve that that may be um, that may pose uh, opportunities for the, the county to, to purchase. But uh, let's turn to, to Paul from um, Camp Williams. Um, um, could you talk? There's actually a question here. Um, uh, Camp Williams buffer areas, will you be purchasing land um, and will you be clearing the buffer for fire protection, try and or try to preserve the land. So a um, lot, lot, lot there. Conservation, um, uh, what is this, this buffer? What does it uh, include? And um, uh, other uh, plans that you have uh, related to recreation? Or okay, well, I'll, I'll try and answer several of these questions yeah. here. <laughs> this one, there's a lot going on. <clears throat> so Camp Williams, uh, we're trying to provide a buffer around Camp Williams, which many may know. Uh, we're, our goal is to encumber around 11,443 acres in total. And in doing that, our secondary, primary secondary goal in trying to protect the training mission is to keep the open space as open space, uh, protect wildlife uh, uh, habitat, protect uh, wildlife migration routes and everything else. And so uh, another aspect of this is fire protection. And so no, we do definitely do not wanna clear uh, any of this open space or this habitat. But what we would like to do is provide some uh, connectivity for uh, recreational trails into the Yellow Fork area and Rose Canyon and down through Harriman City and, and all the way around Camp Williams for, uh, for what that's worth. But in doing so, we're looking at providing uh, some additional layers of fire protection and maybe some of these trails can work as uh, additional fire breaks. And it also gives us an opportunity to perhaps graze down some of the fire fuels around Camp Williams. Uh, currently we graze inside our fence and that helps tremendously. Uh, there is not an effort outside the fence. And so uh, that's, those are some things that we're looking at. Uh, we work with the uh, Utah Division of Natural Resources to uh, identify migration routes and habitat. And we currently work with them. We have a specialist inside Camp Williams who works with wildlife. And so it's, it's very much a part of uh, what we're trying to do. And uh, in answering uh, Gene's question, I know there's there's talk of uh, putting a trail around Camp Williams, which would be potentially uh, above uh, High Country One and Two. As far as uh, the trespass uh, trespassing issue, I'm not sure that we've uh, got that far. I know we've discussed it. We don't want anyone coming off any trails down into private property. Uh, just like in Camp Williams right now, we have a tremendous trespass problem with people coming out of uh, High Country 1 and 2 and trespassing on Camp Williams. And so, and, and with deer poaching and other things along those lines. And so it's definitely going to be uh, part of the conversation. And I think when we get to that point, uh, we'll uh, talk to the Homeowners Association in the High Country area and and work with you, and and if we're going to do any of those things, that it would be uh, it would work for everybody. So I hope I answered a few of those questions. I I can kind of speak to that as well a sure. little bit because um, I know there's been concerns with trespassing from high country states as we look at um, updating the master plan for Rose Canyon, Yellow Fork, and the Butterfield Canyon areas. Um, we have, uh, we've been working with the trail subcommittee and the steering committee. And one of the members on that committee is a resident of High Country Estates and is very familiar and plugged into 
some of the concerns um, that the uh, residents of high country estates have as far as trespassing goes. So we've met with him on site. We've dis discussed in length some of the areas that they, he sees and other residents see trespassers entering and exiting um, the area in the HOA. And so uh, obviously signage is one way that we can try to help with that. Currently, um, there is a lack of signage in, in, in those areas and we are working towards um, signing a lot of the trails and, and, and also making sure that people are aware which trails they shouldn't be on, um, which a lot of those trails uh, can and do lead into the high country, high country estates area. Um, so that is one of the means that we're looking at is signage, obviously. And then there's, you know, just continuing to work with the, the residents there and with the, um, uh, the stakeholders to, to try and prevent that. But it is it's challenging and enforcement is challenging, especially in a large area like that. And as, as the trails develop and funding, beco funding becomes more available, we really need to be able to put those funds towards um, hiring more staff and helping uh, deal with some of those issues. Great. Thank you. Um, we have 10 minutes left and I want to get to a couple of uh, questions here and so we can respect people's time and end on time. Um, there are a couple questions related to uh, Rio Tinto. Um, uh, does the county have a published plan for acquiring land from uh, Rio Tinto? Are there any other potential options for the county to increase decision-making opportunities by reducing the power and uh, the, right, by reducing the power and control the company has on the area? Um, then relatedly, um, what is the best way to have our voices heard with Rio Tinto Canicot? I've lived in the shadow of the Ochre Mountains most of my life and I've had very little access to them. Uh, instead, I've had to watch the pollution and industrial uses that currently exist. I worry about how they will develop the land in the future. So some pretty meaty questions there. Um, Ryan or Jake, is that, uh, would you like to start or? I'm gonna just, Ryan, you're starting. <laughs> or, and, and Jake, I, you might be best suited to answer some of these. Um, uh, so I, I, I think that the first thing is that, um, you know, Salt Lake County does not own uh, the land in this area uh, outside of our open space and recreational and those those uh, those property owners do have rights that are associated with them and so I think that the purpose of this plan is to really plan long term what are our goals and visions associated with this land and uh, I, I think that that's a great idea for uh, you know how do we as if land becomes available how to how how do we plan for purchasing that? How do we plan for our open space management? Those different types of things. And I think our goals and our visions is, is going to be fine tuned as we go through this process of really identifying those needs and first identifying the area that we need to start talking about conserving and recreating in. And for me, I want as much open space recreating and conservation as we can in those canyons. Uh, and so, uh, I, we currently don't have a buyback program. I think, I think that this is the first step in really prioritizing those for uh, Salt Lake County. In terms of, of contact with them, um, you know, I, I'm not sure <laughs> the best answer on that. I, I, I know that uh, we do have contacts where I'm happy to share individuals that we work with and uh, hopefully they'll be responsive to you. Um, I, I, uh, they're in partnership with the county on helping developing trails in our Butterfield Canyon area right now. And so uh, they've, they've been very communicative on, on those fronts. Anything, Jake, else you wanna add? Uh, I would just reiterate that this plan is putting forth a process to go forward in the future, a conservation plan, a conservation process, steps, opportunities, methods. It's kind of taking one step in that direction uh, of starting that. But, but, but certainly it, it's the kind of thing that will take years or, or decades to, to unravel and figure out. Jake, could you just briefly, um, Kennecott, I believe, has been been involved in the planning process or as a stakeholder, certainly. Um, could you talk about their involvement in the process and uh, they're aware of what's going on, I'm assuming, and 
Yes. So we've met with all the landowners, um, including Kennecott, but we've met with all of them. We've received their input. We've talked about it, given them opportunity to talk with the planning commission along with other landowners as well and receive their input and receive their suggestions as well. So they, they have participated in, in the plan okay. like, like any landowner, okay. especially those of, of larger properties as well. Very large properties, yes. Um, I noticed a hand was up, but now I don't see it. Is I'm asking Hillary if she can help me. Is is there still a hand up, Hillary? Or no? There is not, and it does look like the person who had their hand up has left our meeting. So okay. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, from uh, Trace Robinson with Rubikson City. Um, there are many canals that run on the west side of the valley that could be improved and used for active transportation as, as trails. Um, are there any existing agreements with the canal companies that the cities could piggyback with to make the improvements? That's an interesting one. Who is best prepared to answer that? Helen, is that you? Or well, I was kind to look for to Parks and Rec about that. Ah, you know, I'd have well, to do some trail. research. Yeah, I'm not aware that there are any. I think that as situations develop, um, cities contact the local um, canal company, but I don't think there's any wholesale agreements. John, do you have a different experience? Uh, Helen, let me yeah. answer that. Uh, Great. Thanks, Walt. Yeah, uh, we do have uh, an existing easement agreement uh, with Utah Salt Lake Canal Trail. And as you know, we are moving forward uh, quite aggressively, phase after phase, we'll be doing phase four coming up. So yes, uh, we are looking, actively looking to work with uh, the canal companies and these properties that they have. They usually have um, you know, a road, a maintenance road right next to it, which really works well for trails. And so we'll continue to do that as, as canal companies uh, uh, open their doors and say, yes, we'll, we'll work with you as a partner and allow this to happen. I mean, uh, north-south uh, transportation routes are safe and uh, a lot of people use them to get from uh, one destination to the next. Okay, okay. let's see. And I, and I will say that, um, that, that we probably we don't have a whole lot of canals in our unincorporated area at the moment because those really service areas outside of the unincorporated that doesn't really have any residential areas at the moment and so uh, you know there, there will most likely be canals that will be created and those will absolutely be components of that great and and maybe just to benefit you know, Trace and Herman, I'll mention that the West Jordan City has been working with canal companies way on the west side. I want to say the Webley, well, Webley Canal. That well, I know that they've been planning um, jointly with the property owners on the west side, um, like the Jordan Ranch property and stuff, to coordinate uh, trails along the existing canals whenever the future developments, you know, in the master plan communities um, come along. So, again, that's something I know that, that West Jordan is doing in, the, in their growing west side. Okay, great. Um, I am not seeing any more questions. So if you have one, now's the time to, to ask it. Um, I have three minutes left, so hurry and get it in. Right? <laughs> you have one. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, let's see. Well, it doesn't look like we're going to get one. So um, I think I'll just take the time, the opportunity to uh, thank everybody for joining us tonight for uh, this session, um, asked and answered lots of uh, uh, interesting and, and uh, meaningful questions. I hope you um, uh, received information that is, is helpful to you. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to all of our panelists uh, for uh, taking time out to uh, uh, join us for this, uh, for this session and uh, respond to people's uh, questions and comments. Um, this is, uh, as I said at the beginning, the, the last of the four meetings that we're doing um, uh, geographically on this issue. Um, there are always opportunities to provide comments through the website. Um, and actually, let's put that up if we could, um, just so it's up on the, on the board there and everyone can see where it is. 
um, and all of the resources that uh, we've talked about today um, should should be there. Um, and am I missing anything with, with that? Um, I don't think so. Let's see. Um, and um, let's see here. Sorry, I lost my place in what I was talking about. Um, my questions on, uh, submit questions on the website. It's uh, on the, uh, click on submit a question or submit a comment or question on the, the left side of the page there. Um, we also mentioned that uh, when the plan is drafted, it will go to the planning the county planning commission and then to the county council, um, both of which will have opportunities for public engagement and, and discussion. And then uh, the, hopefully by the end of the year, um, everything should be wrapped up um, for the plan. So um, that is it for tonight. Uh, just again, thank you everyone for joining us and taking part in planning for the future of Salt Lake County. Um, hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks very much. <laughs>